Um, so fleas can get anywhere. They can infest the home, the yard, all the animals, you know, dogs and cats, you know, wildlife carry the fleas. Um, <clears throat> here we call cats flea taxis because stray cats that come through tend to have fleas and um, leave them in your yard to get on your dogs. So the owners would have to, you know, be able to notice that. Um, so they're going to see um, puritis. You're going to see that alopecia. If they've been itching a long time, um, just scratching and scratching and the hair starting to come out. The skin starts getting inflamed, um, all just from the flea bites and, the, and um, the fleas being on them. And then more severe reaction to flea bites is the flea allergy dermatitis. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more specifically. <clears throat> All right, so the flea algae dermatitis um, is when it, there's a protein in the flea saliva. And so if a dog has an allergy to that, um, they just have a more intense response. Um, just, you know, one bite, you know, itches 10 times more, you know, so to speak, um, than for another dog. So they have puritis. It's usually a lot more intense. They just can't stop scratching they're gonna start having um, papular dermatitis. Usually we need to see that on the body, kind of on the back, near the base of the tail, um, abdomen and hind legs, all the areas that they can reach to bite and chew themselves easily. Um, we'll start seeing that pop up there. Um, when they start chewing at one particular spot and it's developing a raw area, it's called a pyotraumatic dermatitis aka hot spot, you know, where they just chewed one spot raw, and that's just a secondary um, local infection that they've caused. <clears throat> um, I found this um, chart, um, I did pull it off the internet, it just kind of was a little kind of diagram of how flea allergy dermatitis works. So you start here where the flea bites the dog, the saliva causes the, um, the um, reaction, and then the dogs start to exploitate themselves. They have inflammation and, you know, they're just causing self-trauma. Um, and then you have bacteria that comes in and then you have all these things develop on the dog's like back. And you can kind of see, this is a, a, um, how you would kind of see more um, typical where it just comes on the back and near the base of the tail is where you would see most of these symptoms. Um, a couple of other pictures. So this on the right is a picture of um, a hot spot. So they've just chewed themselves raw. Um, you can see a lot of um, erythema and redness. Usually these are moist. You know, there's maybe some oozing exudate going on um, <clears throat> where they've just concentrated on that one spot. This is a picture of, of that back and near the tail is down here where you have some alopecia. And this is kind of a chronic flea allergy dermatitis. This has been going on a while um, where you have some severe alopecia, some scaliness. You even have some hyperpigmentation of the skin coming in. Um, and this, this kind of takes a while. And sometimes when it's this bad, they're going to have some scarring and that hair may not come in. Um, completely. <clears throat> All right, so that's kind of how it looks. So let's talk about how to treat it. Um, the first thing, of course, is going to be get rid of the fleas. We're going to get rid of the fleas and we're going to treat the itching and then the infection and try to get them to feeling better. So for flea eradication and control, um, you're going to treat the environment. And I always recommend treating inside and outside, even if you haven't, the owner hasn't seen fleas in the house. Um, it's usually good to treat both at the same time that you're treating the dog so that you're just taking con back control and making sure the fleas aren't going to continue to infest the area. Um, <clears throat> so there are different things for treating outside. Um, depending on what you have available, you know, yard sprays and stuff, and then sprays for the home also. Um, and then for treating the, the dog, um, <clears throat> starting them on flea prevention, 
um, sorry about that. Um, if they have a lot of fleas and flea dirt, you know, you definitely want to, you know, a flea bath, a bath and a shampoo um, will help to try to cleanse the skin and kill some of those fleas and then getting them on a flea prevention um, to keep the fleas from coming back. So I put a bunch of pictures on here. There's a lot of different things available um, to, for flea prevention. Um, there's a lot of combination things now. Um, so the biggest thing is you have um, a couple of things I put on here that I know are available in your area or close to you. Um, the Delta Methrin um, is an ectoparasite that well, you can that I believe is a topical. And then Fipronil is a big one. It's been around a long time. And I know the spray, when you spray it on them, like it kills the fleas, like you see them hopping off and dying. Um, so the, the spray works pretty good to, especially if there's a big infestation, to just start spraying them to, to help get the fleas off. <clears throat> um, I listed a bunch of others here. Um, there are some oral um, preventions, Capstar is one, Night and Pyram. Um, Spinosad that are oral just flea preventions and then some combinations here um, if they're available. Um, um, and then some, you know, Silomectin is revolution. It's also topical. And then so is it this um, imidacloprid and moxidectin. And then um, Spinosad, milbamycin, which is trifexis. Um, is one here that is heartworm and flea prevention. All three of these are, but that's an oral one that, that you would give. Um, so someone asked if we need to muzzle the dog while using Fipronil and if there's toxicity, if they lick it. Um, <clears throat> Fipronil doesn't burn, so you shouldn't have to muzzle them um, unless they are just super painful. I mean, if they have some really raw skin um, like a hot spot or just where they've chewed themselves raw, you might want to be careful. It may burn then, but if the skin is not um, <clears throat> open, if it's closed, it should not burn them. Um, as far as licking it, usually it just cause some oral irritation, um, maybe some um, drooling or foaming at the mouth, but that's usually about it. Um, <clears throat> some other flea preventions, there are some that are combining flea and tick. Um, and then Serolinar is a, is a big one here. I'm not sure if you have it available there. Um, that's the one that does all three, fleas, ticks, and heartworms is the Semperica Trio. A lot of our owners like that because it's just easier to remember. But there are some others on here that also treat ticks, which we're going to get to um, in just a little bit. So we talked about getting rid of the fleas, pre preventing them, um, but we still have to treat the dog. So treatment for puritis, because we know they're itching, we, we see them scratching. Um, <clears throat> so I typically like to use prednisone. It's a glucocorticoid. It's going to stop the itching. Um, and I use a taper dose. Um, all my doses that you will see in this presentation are from um, Plum's drug formulary. I use that on a daily basis. So I go to that for my, for my um, doses. Um, <clears throat> so with the steroid um, works very well. It does stop the itching. It helps the inflammation. Um, I use a taper dose and I, you know, that can cause some increased thirst and urination that goes away once the medication is done. So I make sure to tell the owners that that's just one of the side effects of that medication. Another big one um, <clears throat> is Apoquel. Um, it does stop itching. We use it a lot more for allergy pets, um, but you can use it here to stop the itching. Um, antihistamines are another big one I used. I kind of just try to determine like how bad are they, you know, are they itching a little bit? We're catching it pretty early. Maybe, you know, diphenhydramine or cetirizine will work versus one of these other drugs. Um, but if they're chewing themselves raw to the point, you know, they're bleeding and they have open sores, you're going to need to do one of these other two, specifically probably a steroid to get them comfortable. You can also bathe them in a shampoo, um, permoxine, oatmeal, 
base shampoo that's just soothing and relieving the skin, um, giving some moisture also. Um, <clears throat> EpiSoup is a good one. Relief is one that is one of the brands that has the Promoxine in it, which is a topical itch relief. Um, there are also some shampoos that have Benadryl diphenhydramine in them to help with topical itch relief also. <clears throat> so we've gotten rid of the fleas. We were helping them with their itching. So the net, the one of the last things you're going to do is to treat the secondary infection that may be present. Um, so <clears throat> usually if you have that hot spot or if you have some sores, you know, from them chewing, most likely a secondary infection is present. Um, so you can treat that with, with several different antibiotics. Um, cephalexin and cephpodoxime are cephalosporins that work really good. Um, your moxicillins can also work. Um, <clears throat> the last one is, I believe, an injectable. So, I mean, if they're in really bad shape and, and you're, and especially if they're not feeling good, they're not wanting to eat, that may be an option um, to do also. Um, also with these infections and with these flea allergy dermatitis um, dogs, <clears throat> sometimes it can take up to 21 days, maybe even a little longer to get this infection under control. Um, it's just sometimes they're just so deep that they need to stay on it longer than the typical range for an antibiotic for their skin. Um, so just keep that in mind, you know, that they're gonna be on it for quite a bit. <clears throat> Excuse me, so, all right. So that's wraps up our fleas and our flea allergy dermatitis. So we're gonna move on to ticks. <clears throat> We see those pretty often here, and in, in, I'm in Tennessee in southeast um, of the U.S., and we see ticks almost year-round here. So we always recommend our dogs stay on, on tick prevention year-round. We don't have cold enough weather for them to die. So I kind of listed four of some of the top four ticks that we see, um, and then also listed some of the diseases that they can transmit that are also can be zoonotic. Um, so the exodes scapularis, which we call, so the black leg tick or the deer tick um, is, can transmit Lyme disease. Um, the rhipicephalus sanguinis can transmit ehrlichiosis and babesiosis. And then the dermacenter verbalis is a dog tick, can transmit Rocky Mountain spotted fever. And the amblyoma americanum is our lone star tick. So I, kind of, I found some pictures of them. Um, this chart has <clears throat> um, the exodes and amblyoma and the derma center ticks on here. Sorry, I don't know why my screen is doing that. Um, but it just shows you the adult tick and then kind of the different life stages and then the size of them compared to each other. And then the picture on the right is the ripicephalus tick. Just to kind of give you an idea. Sometimes we have, we call these little ticks seed ticks here. And um, you can walk through the woods and like the dogs can just get hundreds of them on them um, pretty quickly if they go through like a nesting area. <clears throat> All right, so clinical signs of the tick, you're gonna see the ticks on the skin most likely um, attached to the skin. Um, depending on how long they are there, depends on if they have actually are able to transmit a disease. Um, usually you can start seeing some petechia or inflammation around that tick bite when the longer they're there. Um, and with some of the tick-borne diseases, um, you can start seeing some lethargy and like limping or lameness, joint issues, which could kind of indicate maybe that they have the ticks on them long enough that they have contracted a disease. Um, also, you can see anemia especially if there's a big infestation of ticks and there's like just tons attached to them, you can start seeing some anemia because of the blood loss from the, 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 dick, the ticks having their um, blood meal. And then another severe reaction or cause from the ticks is called tick paralysis. And um, I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more specifically in a minute. So a couple of pictures I pulled up. Um, and the one on the left, of your of with shows two ticks kind of attached to inside the paw. It's between the toes, 
and you can start seeing a little redness here where they've been on there for a little while that they're starting to get some inflammation there. And this one is just attached and it's starting to embed. The longer they're there, they kind of get embedded in the skin and, and the skin starts getting really angry and swollen, um, probably starting to have a, an infection there um, from the tick being there so long. <clears throat> so treatment. So same with fleas. Let's get rid of the ticks, um, remove them, being sure. I mean, if you're if there's just a few and you're taking them off with some hemostats or tweezers, you know, making sure that the entire tick is removed, including the head and the mouth parts. If those are left behind, that can cause more, more inflammation and infection in that bite site. <clears throat> um, clean that area well. Usually antibacterial soap is fine. You know, I-9, chlorhex scrub, you know, anything like that, just scrub it really good. Um, clean it well. If there is a lot of inflammation or swelling in the bite where the tick bite was, usually I will um, maybe prescribe an anti-inflammatory or an antibiotic. Um, and then prevention and then treating the area um, if needed, treating the yard especially. <laughs> so some tick preventions. Um, again, fipronil is good. Um, the spray, you know, definitely does clean and tick. Um, and once it's sprayed on, um, it does last for up to a month. Um, once you do that initial um, application, unless you apply it and you bathe them right after, then, then you may have to, it won't last long. Um, several others um, on here, um, imidacloprid, permethrin, pyroproxifen is k Advantix is topical. Um, salomectin, and then um, there's also a collar, a midocloprid flumethrin collar. Um, and I think there's another one. I, I had a picture and I forgot to add it in and that um, that does it also. Um, it's a collar that, that's pretty, pretty helpful. This collar specifically lasts six to eight months. And then some other floral per, oral preventions. Um, that are once a month or every three months that can prevent the ticks also. Um, usually if we have, I have a pet that has had a tick on, it looks like it's been there for a while, like over, you know, two or three days, I recommend them testing for tick-borne diseases, typically anywhere from three to six weeks after the tick bite, um, just to see if they've contracted one of those diseases, depending on if we can identify the tick or if the owner, sometimes the owner removes it and we just see the actual tick bite. Um, and then I made a list of some of those tick-borne diseases that are zoonotic, um, meaning that, you know, they can pass that on to, you know, if they attach to uh, humans, um, we can catch, we can contract those also. <clears throat> so tick paralysis specifically, um, it's caused by neurotoxin when the tick bites um, and it causes a flaccid paralysis. So usually it's the hind legs, you know, they can't stand up or they're dragging their legs some, or they're real wobbly and ataxic. Um, usually it happens about a week after a female tick attaches and it's specifically the female tick that causes this. And it can actually, we think about the tick paralysis has to occur when there's an infestation of ticks, but not, it not necessarily can only be, it can take one tick to cause this and they could have a hundred ticks on them, but just one of those is causing this tick paralysis. So you're removing all the ticks or as many as possible, um, in supportive care for that dog, depending on what's needed. Um, if you can't find the tick or if there's just so many, you're doing some of the um, insecticidal baths, um, dipping, trying to get the ticks to die and fall off. Um, usually once that tick that is causing it is removed or dies and comes off, one to three days, you start seeing the, the pet improve and start walking there. You know, there'll be wobbly, but they're starting to walk and get the, be able to use those legs again. So this is a picture, kind of one that's got hundreds of ticks attached. And then this dog just had one. And he, this one tick here was causing a tick paralysis. So um, doesn't have to look like this. It can be just one causing it. <clears throat> 
Okay, so that's ticks. Let's move on. We're going to go over canine demodicosis. So we see this one here a lot, especially in our puppies. Um, it's called by the demodex canis mite um, is the most common. There are some other, a um, couple other ones out there where this is the most common one that we're going to see in our dogs. Um, and the hard part of it is it is part of their normal flora or fauna. So it's there um, on their skin. It resides in the hair follicles. Um, it is transmitted from the mother to the neonate when they're nursing. Um, what causes <clears throat> the issues that we see from this mite is when they start to proliferate and the immune system can't handle it. Um, and so we see it like our younger dogs because they're growing, you know, they're stressed, they're, you know, they're teething, they're, you know, they're training and that can cause those to proliferate and the immune system can't handle it. Um, in our adult dogs, and we see it in our older ones, um, it's usually their stress related or, you know, because stress does decrease the immune system. So then it can't function properly um, and allows those mites to proliferate and cause the skin issues that we see. Um, this can also be related to um, dogs if they have a disease that's compromising the immune system, it can allow this to come out also. <clears throat> so that's a good picture of the mite um, under the microscope, kind of looks like a cigar. That's how I kind of always remember it. <clears throat> Some clinical signs of, of this mite, um, erythema, scaling, um, alopecia, they do have puritis, so they're itching some. Usually it's located on the face, kind of around the eyes. You might start seeing some thinning of the hair around the eyes, maybe around the ears, the muzzle. <clears throat> um, sometimes it can be more generalized. And so you have patches of erythema and alopecia on the body also. Um, and it just kind of depends on how long it's been going on. Secondary bacterial infections are very common with um, the Demodex mite. <clears throat> so this is just a couple of pictures. You know, you could kind of see on this dog, you know, he's starting to have thinning here. And he's got some redness going on, starting to go up here on the ears. Um, and then this is a paw that had more of a, a localized on the paw here. Some of the same lesions, you know, scaling, um, thinning of hair, redness, you know, the, and he's probably been licking or chewing at this also causing the, that to worsen. <clears throat> So how do we diagnose this? And I'll be honest, a lot of times, you know, we can look at a dog. It depends on how often we see it and just say like, we, it just looks like it has demon X. Um, so we diagnose it with a skin scraping and this is, there are two different kinds of skin scrapings. And I have some videos to show you. Um, there's a deep and a superficial for demon X. <clears throat> We're going to do a deep skin scraping because you need to get it out of that hair follicle so that you could find it. <clears throat> this is the most common method used. Um, if you have two or more <clears throat> on that scraping, it's diagnostic because it is part of the normal fauna. If you find one, it necessarily could not be a diagnostic find unless there are the symptoms of the skin that go along with it. <clears throat> Another um, diagnostic technique, and I learned this one, I know it's been around a while, but I actually learned this myself last year. Um, is called a trichogram and <clears throat> it's less painful and it's very ideal to use around the eyes. I, I, I it always get really concerned when I have to do a skin scraping around the eyes because they're not going to be still and I'm always worried I'm going to cut them or I'm going to jab their eyeball and that just makes me nervous. So I've learned how to do this at a, at a conference and you just... <clears throat> And I've, I've used it since and, and it was diagnostic and I was very excited because it's just another way to get around those eyes, especially without, without worrying about hitting the eye with your, with the scalpel blade that you use for a scraping or um, then moving around and you cutting the skin. <clears throat> so on the skin scrape technique, the deep one, I kind of went through it step-by-step step here. Um, on how to do it. You're isolating it. We are using a tin blade. 
um, I put, put it here, tin blade with some mineral oil and you're going to have a slide and then you just kind of pinch up that area and then you're going to place your blade kind of nine degrees and start scraping and you're squeezing the skin between your finger and your thumb as you scrape to try to squeeze up out of the hair follicles and you're going to scrape till you have some capillary bleeding and then you're going to put that on your <clears throat> side with mineral oil and then look at it to find the mite in that sample. <clears throat> so I have a little video I found on YouTube um, that shows that demonstrates this. Um, so I'm hoping this will work. Okay, to take a deep skin scraping, you would be doing the same thing, but take the skin. I don't really need one, so I'm not going to really do it, but I just want to demonstrate the, uh, the motion would be a little bit different. So, for instance, you would pinch up the skin and scrape, 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 scrape in one area until you had some capillary bleed. All right, so then you would take that, put it on the slide in the same way. Um, okay, so let me. Um, we do not come in. I can. I don't know how to make that share. Okay, so take a deep skin scraping. You would be doing the same thing. Hey there, today we're going to do an example of a. Okay. Um, so I can put the link here in the okay to so take a deep skin scraping you would be doing the same thing all right I'm going to paste that I think in the chat box I think that will okay <clears throat> It will not let me paste that. Um, <clears throat> or you can, Nicole, you can stop sharing this. Okay. And you, you can put a new new share. You can add a one more share, then you can show the YouTube. Okay. Okay. Um, someone said that it won't show, <clears throat> the YouTube videos won't show up in Zoom because of um, copyright. But the links are here, um, and, I, and it's it just kind of shows you exactly what I listed here on um, just how you're doing it. Um, <clears throat> um, after you get this slide, you do the scraping on the mineral oil, then you would put the cover slip on and go to the microscope and check for that mite, the cigar-shaped mite that um, will show up. If there's several different lesions, you know, spots, I recommend scraping more than one spot um, just because one may give you no mites and then you may scrape another one and get, you know, two or three. So if there's several different areas, you may want to scrape up more than one spot to see if you can find that mite. <clears throat> um, for the trichogram, <clears throat> excuse me, for the trichogram, <clears throat> same pretty much the same materials you're going to be using a slide and a cover slip and that mineral oil but you're going to use kind of a small curved hemostat called a mosquito that you can just pluck out those hairs <clears throat> and you're going to pluck about 20 or 30 hairs out of that area and then put them in mineral oil on your slide and do the same thing and look for the mite on those hair follicles <clears throat> um <clears throat> all right so for treatment, so we've, we're diagnosed, we've diagnosed it. We know this is what's going on. So now we're going to move on to treatment. Um, pretty much all the treatments for DMDX are extra label. Um, ivermectin is, is, has been the gold standard for a long time. 
before anything else came out that would also treat it. Um, <clears throat> you're giving it once a day for at least four weeks. Um, you're doing some, usually once a month, you can do a skin scraping. And then if you get too negative, then you want to go a few weeks past that um, to make sure that, <clears throat> that it's gone. The biggest thing about ivermectin, you know, it is contraindicated in like the collies and sheepdogs and herding breeds, herding breeds, just because they have that gene mutation and it can be very toxic to them. Ivermectin can also, um, it, you know, giving them the dose sometimes it can start causing a gastrointestinal upset. So sometimes you have to back down on the dose a little bit and then wean them back up to the dose they should be on um, so that their body can handle it. Um, a couple of other things that um, <clears throat> work, milbamycin, which is actually a heart rate prevention, um, will treat Demodex extra label, and some of our flea and tick preventions also will treat Demodex extra label. But again, ivermectin, I mean, it is extra label, but it's been the go-to to treat this for a long time. Um, <clears throat> also you can dip, um, Mitoban, which is Amitraz dip is actually FDA approved here, um, for Demodex. Um, you dip them weekly, you don't rinse it off. You let it dry on their skin. Um, this isn't recommended for puppies under four months uh, of age. Um, and it can cause immune system suppression and it can cause some CNS signs. So you can see some really marked lethargy, ataxia, um, you know, they, their bodies just can't handle it. So if you see some of that after dipping them the first time, it may not be something you want to continue with that pet. <clears throat> so secondary bacterial infection, some of the same antibiotics that we use when we were treating the flea algae dermatitis. Um, and then also again, antihistamines to help some with the itching. These guys itch too. Um, <clears throat> I typically don't use a steroid with these unless I absolutely have to, just because the steroid can cause some, um, immune suppression, which is why they usually have this in the first place. Cause their immune system can't handle it. So usually stick with, um, <clears throat> um, an antihistamine. Um, I have a question about using ivermectin for puppies. I have used ivermectin in puppies because you would go by their weight and make sure they're getting the correct dose. Um, just being sure that, you know, they're not developing some diarrhea from it um, or inappetence. I usually recommend always giving it while they're eating or right after, just so they have that food to buffer it in their system. Um, <clears throat> um, Another part of the treatment for the secondary bacterial infection is um, bathing and shampoo. Um, benzoyl peroxide shampoo is good. You just kind of want to use a shampoo that's going to cleanse that hair follicle and just cleanse their skin good. Um, so there's there's many out there. Um, there's chlorhexidine shampoos, you know, in combinations that kind of help cleanse that skin some. This you can also bathe them before you dip. Um, this kind of helps cleanse the skin and then put the dip on, and let it dry. <clears throat> All right. So that was Demodex. Um, sarcoptic mange um, is Sarcoptes scabii. So it's also called scabies, um, layman's term for that. This one is highly pyritic. It's very contagious to other dogs and it is zoonotic to people. That's something that the Demodex was not. You know, Demodex, the Demodex mite is not contagious to other dogs. Um, by contact, and um, it is not zoonotic to people. Um, this could affect all animals of any age, um, <clears throat> and it can take up to six weeks to show symptoms. So if they were in contact with the dog today, I mean, it could be six weeks before we actually see anything happen. <clears throat> so some clinical signs that you will see for this. Um, alopecia, um, usually they have a rash that's like on the edge of the ears, elbows, hocks um, on the belly. They're scratching all the time. Um, you know, the dog that you just see that just can't sit still because it's scratching constantly. Um, <clears throat> if this has been going on for a while and it's becoming be a chronic issue, they start getting the alopecia around the eyes. Also, um, they're excoriating their skin from chewing and biting. Um, they can develop pyodermas also. So this is a, a dog 
that um, has a pretty severe infection. This is going, this is going into chronic. You can see around the eyes, he's losing the hair and on his muzzle, his ear, the pin of there, just the hair is gone almost because of just the chronic nature of this. So the diagnosis for this, <clears throat> again, sometimes we see him walk in the door or you go over to the farm call and you're like, this dog has sarcoptic mange. Um, you would do a skin scraping for this and it's more of a superficial scraping. Um, so unlike with the Demodex, the deep scraping we use for the Demodex, um, you're not going to have to like really squeeze and, and get that capillary bleeding. You're just doing it more superficial and getting some of those skin cells. Um, and then looking at <clears throat> under the microscope with the mineral oil, um, to look for those, um, mites. There is a, a link here also, um, <clears throat> for the video that will actually show you how to do it. <clears throat> so treatment for sarcoptic mange, um, celomectin, which is revolution, is the only labeled treatment. All Everything else is extra labeled. Um, and that's a topical, it's a topical flea and heartworm prevention, but you would actually use it every two weeks instead of every four weeks to treat the sarcoptic mange. Um, ivermectin again is listed and that's another one that, you know, usually is our, is a lot of people's go-to. It has been around a long time. Um, instead of giving it daily, as you would give with a Demodex, you're going to give it once a week for four, usually up to four weeks. So usually it's not as, um, bothersome to the stomach as giving it daily. Um, but you would still monitor for that. And again, ivermectin is contraindicated in those specific breeds. <clears throat> um, Milbamycin again, um, and then some of the other flea and tick preventions can be used extra label to treat the sarcoptic mange. Um, <clears throat> the mitoban dip also, and then there's another one, lime sulfur dip li um, can be used for this um, once a week um, to kill the mange also. Um, and it, so we've, you know, we identified it, we're treating the, the, the mites, um, and the, <clears throat> we want to treat the um, pyoderma. So the same antibiotics and the same with some of the others, you're going to be treating this for a lot longer than a normal range of antibiotic use. So usually for about 21 days, maybe a little longer, depending on how severe the infection is. Um, you can use antihistamines the same as um, <clears throat> um, for the itching. And then I will use, um, depending on how bad they are, I will use a low dose um, glucocorticoid like prednisone um, and a tapered dose for this um, to get them comfortable. Um, and then something I always make sure to tell my owners is that it can take up to six weeks, if not longer, depending on how bad the infection is for the puritis and the symptoms to resolve. Um, Cause you know, some people they just want things to go away within a few days. And, you know, we have to let them know up front, this is going to take a while to, for their skin to heal from this, um, from this mite. Um, a question, can lime sulfur be used for demon X? Um, I believe it can. I actually was looking at that. Um, it can help some, but I don't think it helps as much with Demodex as it does with sarcoptic mange, but you can definitely use it in combination with some of the other treatments. All right, so <clears throat> moving on from our mange mites, ear mites. Um, we see that a lot. Um, Otodectes side notice mites, um, they cause irritation to the external ear canal and um, any aged animal can have it, so contract them, and these are contagious to other dogs. So sometimes you see them scratching at their, their ears, their head, their neck area. Um, you can see like really dark brown, crusty debris in that ear, outer ear canal just looks really gross. Um, if it's been going on for a while and they've been scratching at the head and the ears, you start seeing crusting and excoriations of the ear pinna just from the constant scratching at the ears. I have also seen some, because they're scratching so much and shaking their head a lot, you know, they can rupture that capillary in the ear and cause an ear hematoma. And then that has to be treated um, along with everything else. <clears throat> so this is what ear mite looks like. Um, 
So this is kind of just a typical ear mite ear, if you want to call it that, where you just have a ton of like just black gross gunk in that external ear canal. Um, you've got some erythema starting because of the inflammation the irritation of that. So for diagnosis of the ear mites, um, a lot of times if they have a really bad infestation of the ear mite, you can actually visualize them moving when you're looking in the ear with the otoscope. If, especially if, unless the dog is moving around a lot and, you know, you can't just get a good visual, um, you can actually see them crawling around. If you can't visualize them, then we do an ear swab <clears throat> and put that in oil under the microscope to check for the mite in, in those ears. Um, you can do a skin scraping if this is a more severe case and you're really not seeing them inside the ear, but there's excoriations around. You can try to do a skin scrape, superficial skin scrape here to look for the mite under the microscope. <clears throat> so treatment for the ear mites, you're going to clean the ears really good with a good ear cleaner, get all of that out of there, um, and then treating with <clears throat> um, an ear mite medication. So there's a bunch of different ones. Again, ivermectin, um, it, you know, we can use it with um, some of the labeled ivermectin um, Acurex. Um, there's so many out there that are labeled for ear mites. Um, there's another one, Tresiderm, which is thiabendazole, neomycin, and a dex. And then <clears throat> um, Epiotic has some that does, that works too. Um, <clears throat> and then just kind of getting cleaned out and getting this medication in. So I listed ivermectin twice on here because it is labeled as an Acurex otic suspension and it comes in little tubes, but you can also use <clears throat> the injectable ivermectin extra label um, as instilling it into the ear or um, injecting it sub Q um, under the skin um, every two weeks to treat the ear mites if that's what is available for you. <clears throat> um, other treatments besides actually putting medication into the ears, um, salomectin, which is revolution is a topical that does also treat ear mites. Um, so I have a lot of, if we have dogs coming in, especially puppies that are maybe rescues or strays that somebody found and they have so much going on, you know, they've got Demodex or sarcoptic mange or both, and they have ear mites, you know, there's fleas. <clears throat> Salomectin is usually my go-to because it will help treat most all of those things. <clears throat> and you're not overwhelming their system with, you know, a bunch of treatments. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> all right, chyoteliosis. So that's chyotella yaspiri mite also called the walking dandruff um, because it's actually a pretty large size and you can actually see it with the naked eye. Um, this is zoonotic mite. Um, so it has similarities to some of the other ones, causes pruritus, scaling. Um, we can kind of suspect that if the owner is saying, yeah, I've got you know, some of these itchy skin lesions, you know, going on, then that might, you know, be a red flag for us. About, okay, this could be a mite that we're seeing that's causing these issues. <clears throat> so this is kind of a picture. You can see some scaling of the skin there. Um, maybe a few of these are mites. Um, diagnosis for this is pretty easy. Um, usually flea combing, collecting all that debris. This is a picture of like a pile of, you know, debris from that. And then looking at that under the microscope, just on 10X. Um, if you don't see anything moving without the microscope, a lot of times you can just get a magnifying glass, a handheld magnifying glass, and just look at it through that and see them moving. Um, <clears throat> I haven't really seen this maybe once or twice on a dog. I've seen it um, more um, in rabbits. Um, when I um, was director of the vet tech program, we would get rabbits in for the techs to learn how to draw blood from the ear. And we would have some that come in with um, these mites on them. treatment, um, extra label. And if you diagnose this in one dog, you should treat all of them. And that kind of goes the same for like fleas and ticks and the sarcoptic mange and even the ear mites, you know, if there are other dogs in the around, they should all be treated for those, um, especially if they're showing some symptoms of the mange. 
Um, again, ivermectin once a week for four treatments is, is one that's extra label use for this. Salamectin Sel, um, can be used, the revolution again. And then milbamycin is heartworm prevention that is extra label to treat these mites. Um, <clears throat> topical, you can do the dip here, the mitoban dip, and also the fipronil spray um, can be used for these also. Okay, that is wraps up the ectoparasites. I know it was kind of a lot of information, a lot of drugs. Um, um, sorry, I do apologize that my videos didn't work. Um, they're definitely pretty good if you have a chance to, to look at those. Um, um, one of the questions, um, does permethrin and pyrethroids cause similar signs in dogs and cats? Um, are the signs the same? So permethrin and pyrethroids are toxic to cats. Um, you should not use those in cats. Um, in dogs, um, um, so yeah, you shouldn't use that in cats. And then um, permethrin, um, shouldn't cause much toxicity in dogs unless you use it on it if you're overdosing them by accident. And I'm I'm open for questions. I do hope that all of you could understand me. I, I tried not to talk so fast. <laughs> the benzoyl peroxide, um, the question is, can, does it only use for demon eggs? Um, you can use it um, for other things. Um, it is just a good shampoo to use for, um, just to help cleanse those hair follicles. Um, you can use that in, in any of the skin issues that we see, but especially if there's some infection there or just some, you know, greasy exudate on the skin. Um, it's just a good shampoo that you can use. Um, can you use that for Demodex Gata? Yes, you can. And then how can we prevent ticks and fleas? So that goes back to the side and I can um, pull it back up. There's a bunch of different preventions. Um, Fipronil is a big one. Um, there are some other oral and topicals. Um, depending on what you have available. Also treating the area, you know, I mentioned treating the yard and, and, and I understand too, if there's a, um, if they have a lot of property, you know, then you're just going to treat the immediate area around, you know, the house where the dog maybe stays most of the time, you know, it's hard to treat, you know, if you have, you know, some farmland or whatever, you really can't treat that entire area. So you're going to treat the main area the dog's in and including the home if the dog goes inside. <clears throat> <clears throat> Any other questions? Okay. So the question coming through is that they've read that exodes species of ticks can be difficult to treat because it doesn't stay on the animals too long. So, um, if they're not staying on the animal long, which is if, if they're having, you know, if they're not staying on long enough to transmit that disease, but usually they'll stay on. And when they are full of their blood meal, they'll fall off. Um, so if you're not finding them attached, but you're finding, you know, the owner is suspecting that there's ticks or they've seen them, but they, they can't get them to you before they fall off. You still would want to treat that tick bite area and you would still want to get them started on a tick prevention. 
um, to try to prevent them from coming, from coming. Um, usually when they, it, the tick bites, then um, the, t- the tick prevention is on and then it will die. It will fall off. It will die and fall off before it can have a chance to transmit, um, hopefully, the, any of the diseases. <clears throat> okay. I think that we have come to the end. Of-